Gradually, people were so attracted to the, the affordances of these technologies that privacy kind of retreated into the background and into a state we've got now where it's essentially gone. Having this access to this data makes huge tech companies like Bloom so much more powerful than, than they would be otherwise, and not just in the obvious ways. Of course, there's a lot of uh, worry and, and fear over what they can do with the data, they can track anyone, find anyone, see what every individual is doing at any point in time. But I think there's even deeper reasons why this data empowers these huge companies to control our society and, and make us do things. So lots of predictive technologies which are implemented by these tech giants. It's not only interested in knowing what we're going to do, but influencing the patterns of our movement. So technologies might suggest routes to you from the city, places to go, restaurants to go to, cafes to go to, music to listen to. And these suggestions are not just predicting what we might like to do, they're actually influencing the way citizens move, think, eat, meet, and, and use their city as a space. So London has become a place where a small group of, of, of surveillance capitalist companies like Bloom can control the movements of individuals and, and orchestrate the way they, they move around their city and the way they essentially live, the things they do, the things they, they enjoy, and, and the life they lead. So we're really kind of outsourcing our decision-making, I would say, to, to a huge corporate capitalist company. And there's something very, very scary about that indeed. All these technologies can be used to, to not only influence us to act as the perfect consumer, but also to prevent us from doing radical and revolutionary things. So technologies in, 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 in foreign nations have, that have been used are things like uh, heat map features which show where populations are gathering. Uh, In-game rewards can be offered to people to take different routes, things like that. Um, traffic data can be manipulated to prevent people gathering and protesting, as has happened in, in some of the authoritarian regimes across the world recently. Uh, so what we're looking at is, is not only a, a set of technologies which make people behave as, as ideal consumers, but ones which actually can be put to use to prevent radical and, and disruptive behaviour in the city, which, which limits the, the power of any kind of revolutionary force. So, if you thought you had a private life, get used to it. You don't. And we're not going to reclaim our lives without a fight. I'm Tash, and you've been listening to Buckingham, keeping the resistance informed. Keep listening, keep fighting, and remember, nobody owns you but you. It was a banner year for what many may think an unlikely type of crime. Namely, non-violent crimes committed by people over the age of 75. Impoverished elderly are turning to crime in the hopes of gaining free room and board. Join GBB as we look into the last resort of elder care, prison. London Calling. You're listening to me, Tash, on Buccaneer, your source for what they don't want to know. This time we're turning our focus back on the media to look at my former employer, the GBB. As we know, the broadcaster has been through a lot of changes since the Hassani government gave in to pressure from corporate backers and privatised the corporation. Today, the GBB is a shadow of its former self. It's become a tool used by the government to circulate fake news and misinformation. So how did we get here? Where did it all go wrong? How can we tell when our national media has become state propaganda? Our experts speak on conditions of anonymity for their own safety. Here's disinformation and media expert Charles, who's seen free broadcasters built up by journalists and torn down by demagogues all over the world. So before the media fragmented, there was this voice of authority that was trusted and worthy of trust. Then what we ended up with is a really commercial model where whether you're talking about an app on a smart device or whether you're talking about a broadcaster, the most important thing was to keep you in that environment for the longest amount of time possible. Uh, and because that meant money in their pocket. And in order to do that, a couple of things happened. One was the use of manipulative techniques around behavioral economics, things that would just keep you scrolling or keep you 
listening or keep you looking for more information. The second is that that kind of environment favors sensationalism. And so you got more sensational headlines and more sensational stories, and it didn't matter whether they were true or not. It just kept people in, and it kept them in the loop. So we ended up in a situation where nobody trusted anything, and nobody believed anything at all. And that is the perfect environment for an authoritarian voice to come in and say, no way, we are the truth. So the ground for this environment really got created when we had uh, suddenly authoritarian politicians everywhere. Anything that threatened them or they disagreed with, they would call it disinformation. That's disinformation, that's fake news. And again, we got in a situation where nobody really believed anything. And the trouble is, is if you were telling the truth, it's very hard to get your message to cut through all of the noise of all of the disinformation that's there. So like, you know, you remember out on the edges, there was this story about when they would take a house by force, they would take any infants and they would crucify them. And that's a great, fantastic, viral story. And how do you counter that story with the truth? The only way you can counter it is by saying, no, they didn't. And of course, no one wants to spread that story. No one wants to hear that story. They want to hear the sensationalism. They want to hear how people were victims of violence when in fact they weren't, or they were victims of insurgent forces when in fact they weren't. The news isn't neutral, it's a battleground. Here's media researcher and academic Alfie. The media has, of course, been perhaps the key way in which governments have controlled and influenced their populations. So you know, totalitarian countries have typically used huge mainstream media outlets to sell one kind of news, one kind of biased news to its population. Of course, the media has always played this kind of key role in, in methods of state control. Um, I think what's happening now is perhaps even more concerning where uh, you previously, been pre-crisis Britain, we had perhaps more diverse voices in the media, but now with the GBB, uh, you've really only seen one brand of, of news and therefore only getting one truth. So people end up with a, a very biased and controlled idea of the reality and, and the world that we're actually living in. It was, of course, many concerns and many problems, but in a way there were some positive things that like not all information was coming from one place. And, and so you, you'd have kind of far-right media outlets developing and then left-wing media outlets developing to combat those and, and kind of challenge the, the mainstream newspapers, TV stations, radios, and make sure people were, were questioning the, the, the validity and, and truth of the information they were receiving. So whilst there was the digital afforded more, more fake information, it also makes us suspicious and sceptical of information and makes us question the information we're getting. And I think in pre-crisis Britain, it might not have seemed great at the time, but there was something positive about that, that there was a lot of distrust in the media. And, uh, and, and in the different kinds of truths that are being told. Whereas now, I think you're seeing a, a return to a more, a more traditional and older pre-digital sense, actually, of people just trusting what they're told. And, and that's why we, we, have to, uh, we have to be here with radio stations like this to challenge those conceptions. Most citizens feel pretty hopeless, I think, and, and unable to, to fight back against these kind of huge mainstream corporations that simply entrench and support the the ideals and ideologies of the state, it can it can seem very hopeless indeed. But I think, you know, the fact that you're you're out there listening, we're in here talking shows that there is still a space to combat these false truths and disinformation that's being sold to us. And, and that there's it's never possible really to completely shut down uh, despite all the technologies that they have at their disposal and all the financial and corporate power and all the, the physical power. That it's never quite possible to shut down people's uh, desire to get to the truth and, and fight for their own ideologies and values and, and you know we're, we're out here.